Okay, so today I'm on a Zoom call to Australia. Anthony Jupp. Anthony, you're a, a, a hither, hitherto called Juppy, as everybody calls you. Um, I would describe you as what an industry professional. You've worked all over the world in the betting industry, on course, off course. Um, tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I was just a young man who grew up in the sports mad town of Melbourne. I grew up loving all sports and getting up first thing on a Sunday morning, there was a show called World of Sports. And uh, the first thing they used to show on World of Sports was the replay of the main two races from the uh, whatever the major meeting was the day before. And that was my first glimpse of racing at about age three or four. I remember Kingston Town when he stirred Cox Plate. So that sort of piqued my interest. And then all through school, I always had more than a passing interest in it. And um, yeah, from there, I sort of started betting when I was reasonably young, probably at the start of high school. And it sort of went from there into a career. Of course, you're not allowed to bet at the start of high school these days. Um, <laughs> if you, you've been all over the world, uh, well, at least over to the UK, uh, working in the industry. So we'll talk about your background of that a bit more in a minute. Um, I was interested that when you were over here, you got tangled up with uh, professional punter Dean Valentine. And that, that was a, su a surprise to me. How on earth did that happen? It's, it's actually quite an interesting story. I moved... So I'd sort of gone as far as I could on course over here in Australia, and I wanted to get into the, the corporate side of the, of the bookmaking business. And there was only probably two or three bookmakers, corporate bookmakers here in Australia, and they said, well, you don't really have any corporate experience. And one of my best mates from high school had not long moved to London to go and work as an accountant. So knowing three people in London, I, my wife and I packed up and moved to West Kensington, where we settled down and I hadn't quite got a job yet, but I was buying the racing post each morning. And I remember filling out a competition form and I've entered the competition because it also had the classified for the RP jobs there. So I've sent the entry form in and I've won an all expenses paid trip to the Richmond enclosure on day one of glorious Goodwood. And still singly, one of my greatest days at the races, I've thought this is what I've been missing out on. And being the curious type, I've headed to the ring. I've got a little bit of cash. I'm watching what's happening in the ring. And I'm watching this fellow over here who's trying to bet, not getting too far. And of course, not. I'm not exactly backwards in coming forwards. I've sort of pulled him to one side and said, hello, mate, how you going? I'm just new here. He goes, oh, you, you might come in handy, young man. He goes, do me a favour. He goes, he gave me a couple of grand. He said, uh, just lurk around here and I might send you in to do a little bit of bowling for me and we'll see how you go. So I think by the end of this, by the end of the day, he managed to get the uh, blue square uh, pitch there for a good three or four grand. And uh, saw him at the races whenever I went after that. And uh, yes, he was, he was always good to stop and say hello to. But that was my first encounter with not only Dean, but a professional punter of any kind on that side of the world. And it was just interesting how same attracts same. I could sort of see what he was doing. He could sort of see that I had some idea and therefore we were able to just get together and I was able to help him out a little bit. Oh, just a brilliant day. I really loved that course. I loved the layout. And it was like, I thought, right, this is proper English racing. This is what it's all about. And you were you were based in Brighton at that, at that point, I assume. We'll get back to that no, I was, anyway. No, I was in West London at that stage. I'd only just got there. So um, not long after I got there, I got a job as a grave digger out at a, a cemetery to try and keep the lights on. And then I eventually got a job answering, just started out as a part-time telephone answerer at um, Sporting Index down there in um, near the Oval there. And that was possibly the greatest thing a young man could have ever come into. Right, let's get back to that in a minute. Let's rewind to you in Melbourne watching the replays of the racing and getting into it. That's what attracted you to horse racing. Um, when you were punting, were you winning? I probably, because I was betting so small at that stage, I probably wasn't losing a lot. And again, right place at right time. I'm one of four boys. My youngest brother's 12 years younger than me. I was sort of finishing high school and he was a kindergarten. And my mum was on the local kindergarten committee uh, with a lady there. And um, 
they were talking and she said, well, what does your husband do? And she said, oh, well, my husband's a bookmaker. Oh, yes, my son's very much into racing. And um, the lady said, oh, well, would he like a job? And jumped at the chance. And that was, I was 18. It was um, Champions Day over here, which was last Saturday, just gone. In 1998, I worked my first meeting uh, at Dalnaring Picnic Races which is the sort of Australian equivalent to the point to points. And uh, I worked massively overdressed. I remember that I wore a suit and there was no need to wear a suit because everyone else was there in a shirt and shorts. And I got handed the um, betting bag and I think we held about 25,000 in cash on the first day and, I've, and it just blew me away of, of all the action in the ring and, everything that was happening at the time. So yeah, that's, that, that was my first entrance into the game. So I, I worked for various different bookmakers for about the next eight years on course um, here all around Victoria, but mainly at the picnic races. So tell us a bit more about the picnic races. How, do, how are they sort of organised? Well, these are for the absolute lowest class horses you can find. Um. They're about a tenth of the prize money that we run for at the meetings that are normally covered by the wagering service providers, the WSPs. Um, they're for amateur jockeys. Um, there's no off-course betting on them. So the betting rings are still strong. There'd be a dozen bookmakers still at each of those meetings. And it's one of the few places where it's only a tenner to get in. You can bring half a dozen beers and you can bring your food in as well. So you get a lot of people that attracts that for a really casual day out. And it's a real grassroots sort of feel. And it is a real entry point for a lot of people to get into the game. And is it run under the rules of racing? Yes. Yep. So would and you get... If you... Yeah, carry sorry, on. Sorry. No, you carry no, on. If I Last picnic season, I, owned, I part owned a picnic horse. She managed to win, I think it was six races for the season. And I lost money. Because that's how little prize money is involved. It's it's not much more than running for ribbons there. Okay, so would you would that suggest that the owners have got to land a bit of a touch to make it pay? Is it a bit is it a bit lively? Oh, uh, very much so. Like this one stable would be backing their horse, another stable would be backing that. Oh, this horse must be off today because there's no money for it. The figures were always on your side because. The boogie sort of, not that it was a complete conspiracy, but they sort of looked after one another because you, you had so many unknowns. So there was always percentage on your side, but also it was a really good learning curve for also just like a customer service sort of thing, like how to deal with people, how to get them in, how to get that money and keep them coming back. And yeah, they're still some of the most valuable pitches that we have here now. And um, would you get... Sort of, uh hunters that specialise at sort of picnic races that would beat you? you Very much so, yeah. Like, at, there were guys, that, and it's still, it's probably a little bit more available now, but back in that time, like this is nearly 20 years ago or more, um, you had to buy the tapes of the races from the guy that was filming there that day, and they were the only re video replay that you had. So unless you subscribe to that service... So when you think about it, like you think about that now, now we just click on the internet and up pops the, the replay of it. That was a huge advantage to have that or just be able to see the horses had, even if you were just able to watch it yourself. And also there was a big discrepancy in the riders too. The top two or three riders would ride 60% of the winners. Okay, so it's very much like point to points. Um, so is it still a case that you can't bet these races off course? Yep, still the case. Yep. So is it is so? Does that mean that because I've been interviewing a quite a, a few Australian pro punters sort of over the years, and they all say that the race course itself is absolutely finished or or near near you know on its knees. It, does this mean that the picnics have still held up with the people turning up to bat? Yeah, it's it's not what it was, but of all the for, compared to the drop off at the other meetings. It's, it's still reasonably well protected. You could still go there. We, they race during the right time of year. So it runs from the spring carnival right through our summertime to Easter. And during that time, you could earn a reasonable income out of just going to those meetings compared to, say, some of the other meetings during 
the winter time or during the week. Like this, this shows how bad it can be. I've been to meetings during the week where I've written seven betting tickets for the day. Well, that's not viable, is it? I mean, why do why do no. you still go? It must be force of habit because I've got no other reason why they would go. And it's it's getting to the stage now where if you're there probably one out, you can make it work. But um, I know recently I've been to some of the harness racing meetings and some of the greyhound racing meetings, and I've been the first bookmaker that's worked there for many years because there's just there's no one there anymore. And the gallops, sadly, are heading down that path. Especially during the week, we just have too much racing. Okay, so when you, you're in Victoria, how many race yep. meetings per day in Victoria would there be? Uh, there's one every day of the week. There's two on Friday, two on Saturday, and two on Sunday. So there's about ten or eleven meetings a week. Okay, so but so back when you were, when you were originally talking about it, it was it was quite good. It sounds like it was all the punters say it oh. was still still thriving. So why did you decide yep. to um to leave it all and move to London? Basically, to try and but make a career out of it and go full time rather than just something that I did on the weekend. Um, I went and got some corporate office office experience and and I started my journey there at Sporting Index. Okay, you mentioned that. Uh, Sport and Index was one of the greatest things for a young man. So tell us about oh. Sport and Index. Well, this was, Betfair was still new. Uh, I was in a, we still, we were originators. So we generated all the prices ourselves. So I was in a room with a whole group of, and it was all men at that stage, that were various experts in various sports, all very opinionated but all knew their subject back to front and were all like-minded. I'm still very good mates with a lot of those guys. 15 years on, I still talk to them regularly about like the Cricket World Cup. I've been chatting to a couple of guys about that who I used to work with. There were cricket guys. There were racing guys. There were guys that specialised in darts and Formula One and just the banter in the office. And it was also before political correctness cracked down with how you could talk to customers you could actually have a bit of banter on the phone with the customers because at that stage, there was still a lot of business done over the phones as opposed to just purely over the internet. And any, any names you can throw at us that were working there at the time? Uh, some of the biggest influences there. Uh, uh, Alistair Hunter was there. He did rugby union. He was phenomenal. Um, my dear friend, Jody, he's at um, Spread X now, the grinder. Um uh Tobin, he was there. Like there were some great there were some great guys that were real specialists in there. Um Robin Fairweather was the head of racing. He was a, a good judge. David Billington was a freak. Like that, that there was just some really, really, really sharp, like-minded guys. And the best part about it was if you finish your shift at the same time to them, you'd go and have two or three pints on the way home and have a game of darts. And that was equally as competitive as anything else you did during the day. And with a um a lot of the same names appear when you talk about those days about winning punters. Were the punters that you ever sort of followed in when they came on, you couldn't beat? Yeah, there was, there was, and often we still kept them as marks. They probably couldn't get as much as they wanted, but they were still kept around. And there were guys that were very specialists. Like um, we, the brilliant thing about learning spreads as opposed to just a fixed odds market was they were two way markets. So you had to have, your prices correct. Like it wasn't like over here, if you went to Ballarat on a Tuesday and it was a two-year-old maiden and you didn't know half the horses, well, you put up 140 or 50% and waited for the market to tell you where you should be. Well, when you were trying to come up with the total runs or the distances at a jumps meeting, like you had to come up with those yourself. And um, there were guys that would just sit there and wait to see what you came up with. Because in a lot of cases, it was almost the industry line for a lot of stuff. And was spread, so, betting, yeah, it, yeah. was spread betting a thing in Australia before you came over? Or was it something that was totally new to you? Not really. No, I'd heard of it and I'd seen some of it, but it wasn't prevalent and still isn't prevalent here. Even though we have some sports here that are perfect for it, Aussie rules and cricket are probably the two best spread betting sports you could find. 